Greetings. Welcome to Learner Burn Studios. My name is Eric Stevenson. In today's video, we're going to talk about the tools we want to use for wax working and specifically chasing a wax pattern. We're going to talk about some common issues that most people have in their approach to wax working. We also want to talk about some safety issues that we want to be mindful of. And so with that, let's get started. So to manipulate the wax, we're going to use a variety of different tools, mostly metal. And the reason why we like using metal tools is that it allows us to uh, heat them up. We have a, a couple different approaches we can take. You can certainly buy commercial wax tools, sculpting tools, and by calling them sculpting, typically they're going to be more expensive, but they're also going to be nicer, have a nice, a better balance of a, probably a wider variety of you know, tips and surfaces and you know, to generate different textures. And you can find them in, in sets at you know, your local art supply store. You can also use uh, dental tools. Um, these were ultimately a set that I used or, or purchased. Um, and I did find a link for these and I'll provide actually links for all the tools that I'm going to describe here in this video um, in the description below. But don't feel like you need to run right out to the store and get these things. Um, one nice way to work is that, like I said, ultimately as long as all of our any of the tools we find are metal, we're good to go. And whether they're um, old screwdrivers, uh, tools that you might already find in your toolbox, uh, silverware. And whether you have stuff at home or whether you go to you know, hit the local thrift stop or a garage sale, and you can certainly keep them in the original format they're in, you know, the, the shapes and the scallops or the bowls, you know, for the spoon and whatnot. But like the spoons are real nice, so like here's a kind of a commercial spatula tool. But you can take a, a regular spoon to your anvil or your worktop and smash it flat to actually create a spatula. Then you can go in and grind it and, and generate the shape and or surface area that you might want to utilize. Uh, this was an old butter knife that I, instead of having a long, you know, extended tip on it, I was able to, you know, trim it down and reshape it to give myself a little bit more defined tool. Um, that actually gives me a little bit more control over it as opposed to have something a little bit more unwieldy. So whatever whatever you have at hand is ultimately a, can make a good wax tool. Um, one of my favorite tools is actually a, a whittling knife from, for wood. Um, so in this case I use it for whittling waxes um, and a variety of other things. But it, it, it just, you know, you'll come and find different tools will be, be best for certain situations. In the end, you usually wind up coming up with like one or two, three, uh, that will give you the most variety of the be your go-to tools. Some of the other tools we'll utilize is, um, so again, I like using the metal tools because it allows us to use, um, in this case, I like using a little propane torch uh, to heat my tools. You can also utilize um, little alcohol lamps. Uh, this runs actually just on its own white kerosene, like your Coleman stoves, or in this case, it's just uh, denatured alcohol. Um, it makes a, a little bit cooler of a flame, kind of slows down your you know, your workflow a little bit. Personally, I, I like the, the propane torch. I like to be able to be in control and be fast when I want and a lighter touch when I need it. Um, and you can ultimately control the flame here as well. One of the other tools we can utilize is, are these electric irons soldering irons, wood torches. Now one of the challenges, and this leads us into one of the specific challenges that comes in with wax working in general. A lot of people will get frustrated really, really quickly because they have expectations that they want the wax to work like materials that they're already used to working with. And whether that's wood, clay, or you know, specifically wet clay, you know, the expectation that if we make it soft enough that we can just like gouge our, our thumb through it um, and to move a mass of that wax characteristics of the wax itself really don't lend it to that kind of behavior. The other issues we have is that, okay, so we realize that we need to apply heat to make this softer, but our instinct is to take a tool, heat it in a flame, and apply it, and it winds up being really localized initially, so you usually wind up overheating you know, that region of wax. But even if you find, come up with a little bit of a rhythm, as you're applying more and more heat to this wax, the wax is absorbing it as a whole. And once it reads, reads a critical mass or a, a critical temperature throughout the entire piece, it'll, you'll, the piece will start to deform. And whether that's actually just picking up 
too many fingerprints or deforming in shape. So we really want to be able to find that balance. And so as opposed to utilizing these irons all the time, which is, you know, people will think it will be able to see the little bit faster approach. It, okay, I guess let, let me back up here. So first off, it's like on, these are really handy to use, but they're also way too hot out of the box for the wax. The microcrystalline wax is a petroleum based wax. And so, and we're typically are pouring it like 200, between 200 and 250 degrees. This tool is a 25 watt torch out of the, you know, and so its max temperature is about 700, 750 degrees, which is way too much. And, you know, so this is a carbon based wax and at 400 degrees, it'll spontaneously ignite or flash. So again, this is way too much. Now, one of the ways we can get around this and utilize, still utilizing this as a, a, a solid tool is to use a dimmer switch from the local hardware store and again or I've provided a link down, sit, or down below but this plugs into your power stripper extension cord and then your tool plugs into it plug that back in and so I try to pick up torches that have lights on the end and they do that so you can you know in theory see better what you're actually working on but in our situation it allows in combination with the dimmer switch we can see that light maybe I can't quite see it but you can see that light turning on and off and it just like you know it is a dimmer switch so it's not an exact temperature gauge but it does give us, you know, an idea of one if our torch is on, but also kind of what what kind of overall temperature. And typically, I run this at like certainly at about half half temperature, but more like a quarter or a third, um, depending on what I'm working on. If I, maybe a little bit higher, or maybe like a, a half if I'm doing welding with it. But if I'm trying to do surface texturing, I'll cool it down as much as uh, about a quarter or even a little bit less. And these run about you know 10 or 15 bucks. Uh, but they're super handy and in combination with that little addition it makes this $25 torch uh, much more use usable and a lot more controllable but outside of using those even with the dimmer switch it's still too easy to introduce too much heat to your wax pattern and so that's why I like to utilize the metal tools because then I can get into a rhythm of heating them up working into the wax and it's gonna as soon as I touch the wax it's cooling the tool down so I need to go back reheat the tool while I'm reheating the tool the wax is cooling down and I can come up with a, a little bit more of a rhythm now realistically if you just take one wax and keep working on it keep working on it keep working on it you're going to overheat overheat the wax either by your body heat or the temperature of your tools so you want to be able to Ideally, it's, it's, it's great if you can actually work on multiple waxes at one time. In this, in this case, whether it's a series of, you know, series of the skulls um, or other pieces or whatever you're working on. So you can work on one, one wax, set it aside, let it cool down, pick up your next wax, work on it to a certain point, set it down. And kind of, you know, as you work your way around the table, you can keep all your patterns in the, in the same temperature frame. Be efficient and not be taking steps backward by pushing the wax too prematurely too far. Fundamentally, you know, when we're working with any material, we want to protect our eyes, we want to protect our lungs, and we want to protect our hands. Those three things are the most immediate things we want to cover in working with any sculpture material, but specifically we'll talk about, you know, issues that we want to be mindful of in the wax room. First off, eye protection. When in doubt, it's always good to have, you know, safety glasses, a face shield, goggles, something on, because things do get splashed. And the last thing you want to do is get, in, you know, if you get splashed into the face, to get something into your eyes. Pretty basic. If we're dealing with, as far as um, on our hands, you, know, you can get away with wearing uh, like rubber gloves. Um, I like uh, uh, kind of the nitro gloves, like a three millimeter, it's a little bit heavier, heavier glove, so you can get multiple uses out of it. But more importantly, what you want to be aware of is that as wax splashes on you and whether it's a, a little drip might not be 
be pretty minor. If you have a mold that really sloshes around, if something slips out of your hand and you get a decent volume of wax slapped across your arm or onto your shirt or leg, you, you immediately want to submerge that area if possible in water, cold water. And whether you have a, a basin in the studio where you've been soaking your molds, that's usually kind of easy access, or get to a, a, a bathroom or water fountain and, and get some cold water on that uh, area of wax. And it's going to do a couple different things. It's going to cool the wax down and hopefully lessen the burn aspect of it, but also it's going to stiffen the wax enough that you can actually get the wax back off of you. The wax we use, the microcrystalline, is super sticky when it's molten and soft, and it will stick to you like glue. And so you want to do anything you can to stiffen it up so you can get it off. And then depending on whether it, you know, it's just a minor burn or, or something worse, you need to take the appropriate actions to do some first aid for that, that care. So it's always good to have burn ointments and different things in your first aid kit. The other thing we want to talk about is uh, vapor, respiratory issues. For the most part, as long as you have some you know, good ventilation, whether it's a vent hood overhead, or uh, windows or multiple doors so you have some good cross ventilation through the space that'll take care of a lot of the incidental vapor that you might come in contact with in the wax room but if your room is fairly sealed what you want to do is wear a respirator and more than just a dust mask you want to get something that is fairly well fitting to your face if you're going to the normal you know hardware stores big boxes whatever for the most part they all sell mediums and that might well be suitable for you, but if you're a little bit larger or a little bit smaller, respirators do come in small, medium, and large. So you wanna make sure you find a mask that fits your face appropriately. As far as the filters go, um, all you really need are these uh, HEPA filters. They're purple in color. These are uh, P100s. They'll pull out 99.9 .9 something something of uh, particulates out of the air, including you know silica and some basic vapors. They're good for welding. And in this case, you know, they'll, they'll pull out, the, you know, they'll filter out enough of what we need to uh, for as far as the wax vapor. You know, when we overheat, whether we're, you know, using our hot tools in conjunction with, with the torch or using one of the electric irons, um, or even if you just leave, have your wax pot set on a little bit too high and you walk away from it, you come back in and there's a, a good bit of vapor in your room. And so these are the kind of things we don't want to be breathing in. And so the HEPA filters with the half masks are a nice way to do it. If you do have a beard like myself, you'll say that your beard will uh, make the masks less effective. Um, so what, like what I have to do is really just crank them down and get them you know, as much of a seal as possible. Um, if I know I'm going to be working a lot of wax or in whether it's specifically in the wax room or out in the main shop, then I'll trim my beard extra tight or even go drop down to a goatee um, so I could tuck it inside uh, my mask and get a good seal if I'm doing that type of work that necessitates that. I've been in and out of the wax room, in and out of the foundry practice for 30 plus years now, not necessarily as rigid about my safety gear as I should have been when I was younger. And as a result, I've developed hypersensitivity to a variety of well, pretty much just everything in the studio, anything that produces a, a vapor, anything that I can breathe in just inflames my esophagus and irritates my lungs. And so I, um, I do wear a respirator probably 95, 99% of the time, depending on what I'm doing. And so I actually use a, a, a heavier duty cartridge. It still has a, a it's twofold, a hybrid cartridge. It has the, the HEPA filter on the outside, but it has an active carbon um, uh, component to it as well. Uh, the color code on here, this is actually an olive color, but the olive one is actually the one that pretty much covers every solvent. Um, it is great for, uh, I weld a lot of stainless and aluminum, so it covers me on that. It covers me on the, on the wax fumes and a variety of other solvents. So this is my filter of choice, but that's just you know, me personally. Um, but for this situation, just the, the standard HEPA filter will suffice. Um, one other you know, nice thing to do is, you know, while we're talking about respirators, is that you know, the weight of these larger cartridges on your face can get uh, cumbersome over a period of time, as well as they will potentially interfere if you're dealing with different face shields or welding hoods. And so um, this is why I like the North brand respirators is that you can get um, this series of tubes 
they're literally called a backpack adapter. And so what it allows me to do is put this over, drape this over my head and the filters are on, the, on my backside. So the weight is off my face. It keeps my mask low profile so I can fit other safety gear over it as well as, you know, just again, taking the fatigue off my neck. Now, the one thing you want to remember with respirators in general is that in particular, these respirators, your, your physically, your lungs are, are what powers them and you're sucking air into them and you can actually stress the lungs. So you really don't want to be in a situation where you're wearing your, reg your respirator for more than two hours at a time without being able to take a break, let your, you know, exercise your lungs, just normal breathing, you know, for 10 or 15 minutes before putting your respirator back on. You can eliminate that if you have a more positive feed situation, and we can talk about that in later videos as we move forward. So I think this gives us a good foundation to work from. You know, we'll cover some basic tools, some approaches to wax working, as well as some safety concerns. And so with that, we're going to, in the next video, talk more specifically about how to chase a wax pattern. If you've gotten something from this video, do me a favor and smash the like button. If you'd like to con continue watching uh, this process as we move forward and with the ultimate goal of transforming this wax into metal, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you'll be you say, notified when you know, the next video comes up. And until the next video, be creative and be safe.